settle for the longer way. Zwei Flaschen Whisky für die Zeit. Und ich date gern, aber du bist dabei. Mario geht fuck mal weg, ist weit. Wann ich geh, wann ich geh. Ich werd dir fehlen, du watch sehen. Hab krieg mein Zettel für den langen Weg. Du schenkst da aus mir für den Kahn. Es hat Mario und Dale ganz wunderbar. Hass ich dir den weißen Dank. Wann ich geh, wann ich geh. Ich werd dir fehlen, wann ich geh. Du seh'st nimm ich was ich mach. Du seh'st nimm ich wie ich lach. Ich werd dir fehlen, du wat ich seh. Well, 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 gute Ovid, liebe Leid, good evening, dear friends, dear people out there. It is time for another edition of PA Dutch Live, and it is the November edition. Don't know better, people, in one week we'll be all sitting around eating Thanksgiving dinner, and I can't wait. That's one of my favorites. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on in the show. If this is your first time joining us, I want to give a huge shout out and a gross tongue. Thank you for joining us. You are in for a treat tonight if you are a returning viewer then you know the deal we got an evening full of fun pennsylvania dutch themed stuff and i'm telling you what boys and girls booba und mädel it's gonna be a good one I, I'm really hyping this up because I, I I couldn't sleep last night. I was that excited. We'll talk more about why I was so excited in a little bit as well. If you are joining us for the first time, I always like to begin the show by giving some shout outs to the people that are out there watching. So if you're watching and joining us on the YouTube channel or on Facebook, please, in the comment section, tell me where you are joining us from. There are people already throwing things in here because those are the, those are the standbys. They know every month what to do. So I would like to give some shout outs. Here we go. We're starting with our good friend, David Schellenberger. He's Waving a hand from beautiful Boyertown, Pennsylvania. Dave, it's good to have you back. I love seeing you every month. A lot of these people are returning customers, so to speak, and we love having them. Seth is joining us. Gute Obit von do ufes dach. And not a ne fundo. Thought he was on the roof at first. No, he's in San Diego, West Coast. Well represented right off the bat. Randy Howard, to greetings, Doug, formerly from New Berlin, but now in New Berlinville, Pennsylvania, now in New Berlin, Texas. How about that for a move? Randy, thanks for joining us. Our dear friend and my distant cousin, Carol, is joining us from beautiful Don Tan, Burnville. Carol, are the Christmas decorations up in Burnville yet? Are they holding off a little bit? Oliver Fisher is joining us from the Palatinate near Kaiserslautern, near K-Town. Oliver, I know Kaiserslautern quite well. Thank you for staying up after midnight over there to join us. It's wonderful to have you. Griff Red says, yo, Mr. Maidenford, it's Griff. I'm at the movies, but I still made sure to hop on and say what's up. <laughs> oh, man, uh, just don't annoy the people around you in the movie theater. Griff, uh, Griffin is one of my students right now. He's a senior uh senior german student in my at my high school where i teach hey griff good job thanks uh norman young joins us guda maria that's right it's morning over there austin aldalan from uh the palatinate as well norman watch there's a secret uh easter egg so to speak later on in the show that you'll have to watch for ron diddy jr joining us from wilkes barre now formerly from benderstedel near elizabeth elizabeth Elizabethville, Upper Dauphin County. Thanks for joining us. Our good friend Mo joins us every month as well from Midlothian, Virginia. We are all over the map tonight. This is wonderful. Dolly Moyer is joining us from Berks County. I know where. Beautiful Fleetwood. Beautiful Fleetwood. Karen Freeman is in up in, up in the Alamangle up there in Kempton, the corner of Berks County, a beautiful region right there in the shadows of the Blue Mountains. Wayne Herring is joining us from Oviedo, Florida. Derek Keller, hey, from Wind Gap, Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs now have hex sign uniforms. Derek, you spoiled my surprise, but we'll be talking more about that here in a little bit. Dell Guda Ovid from Fort Smith, Arkansas. Well, thank you for joining us over Arkansas. Yeah, AR is Arkansas, right? I think so. <laughs> Glenn Hogg is joining us from Loganton. I know Glenn too. Guten Tag. Guda Obit. Craig Benner is joining us from beautiful Danton Ephrat of Pennsylvania. I'm telling you, boy, the people, these comments are flowing great. Warren, good evening from Atlanta. Flying up tomorrow. Oh, to Laureldale coming to Pennsylvania. Sorry for the loss of your uncle, though. 
Uh, Scott, our good boy, Scott Regan, good over at my fry now. Some foos from Blowbar, you know, and Penn Argyle, not Hampton Condy. Tonight's conversation is going to revolve a lot around Northampton Condy. So this is going to be an interesting one for you too, Scott. Jesse's joining us. Yep, Benny. How's Neu Holland from New Holland? Schweinschwamm. Oh, what a great town name. Michael is joining us from philadelphia thanks for joining us oh he's a friend of richard's boy richard brought in the brought in the uh, groupies tonight i guess uh we have k hummel main street and Oli. oh ho, good old Oli reach why richard why he's gonna be coming on here in a little bit from german ton rachel yoder our dear friend and another distant cousin kudo with doug we fished hey Ich bin ziemlich gut. I'm pretty good. Boyerstedtel in the house. Yeah. Carol says the decorations are not done yet, but Kozer's Christmas Village is open. That's right, people. If you're in Berks County, you got to check that out. Derek says, Dunavera. Sorry, Doug. That's okay. Jakey Peters says, Chesapeake, Virginia. Well represented. How about that? And by OT, it's Tucson. Todd out there in Tucson. And one last person I hear got, we got Sherry enjoying us from Richland, Pennsylvania. If you missed that, you can always throw in the comment section as we continue on. But as I do every month, I have some news and some uh, updates to bring you guys. Uh, as you know, tonight we are here and Richard will be joining us here in just a little bit to talk about a wonderful topic, PA Dutch tombstones. And it's not going to be all like dreep and dreary. Trust me on this. You got to stick with me on this one. A couple things to mark for your Pennsylvania Dutch calendars coming up on December the 2nd. That'll be here before you know it, dear friends, is the annual Christmas on the farm at the Pennsylvania German Cultural Heritage Center at Kutztown University. It is a wonderful free event for families for anybody stop on out and learn about christmas traditions among the pennsylvania dutch the belschnickel will be making a personal appearance there's some great live music food and entertainment so check out christmas on the farm december 2nd also and this should have been before that but if you're into crafts and art check out the 52nd annual Belschnickel Craft Show, which will be Friday and Saturday, uh, right after Thanksgiving, the 24th and 25th of November. Uh, the dates are there. The time is there. That's in Gilbertsville. If you just search um, Belschnickel Craft Show for more information, you can find that online. Another thing for your calendars, this is now, I think, I don't remember if this is the second, third, or fourth time they've done this. The good people at the Pennsylvania German Samalov are, are going to host their annual Grunsa Lodge for Junge or Groundhog Lodge for Kids, for youth. This year it will be on Sunday, January 28th at the same place it was last year at the Midway Diner in their uh, banquet hall there. That is a Sunday from 1.30 to 3 p.m. I saw photos from last year. There is a lot of really cool things for kids. If you have grandchildren or children that you're trying to get them to know and learn a little bit more about their Pennsylvania Dutch heritage or to learn a little bit of the language or to learn more about why do we celebrate Groundhog Day, this is an awesome, awesome event. It is free. Mark your calendars, dear friends. I do have some news to share as well recently this is a big shout out to our good friends at historic schaferstown they were officially placed on the national register of historic places back in no in early november so that's a wonderful thing they do a lot of great work there to preserve historic schaferstown they have a lot of really cool events throughout the year and now it's officially recognized on the national register of historic places so shout out to them it was leaked earlier but we're gonna this just came out today the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs, which is a triple A minor league baseball team based in the Lehigh Valley. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. Maybe some of you aren't. They are a farm team of the Philadelphia Phillies. They are extremely creative in how they market themselves. There is no other way than put it than that. They do all these special uniforms and uh, events throughout the year and throughout their season. They have a special uniform they wear every once in a while where they change their team name to the Lehigh Valley Scrapple once a year or twice a year. And their uniforms have like cartoon style pieces of Scrapple on them and they have a logo on their hat. They do really cool things like that. Well, it was just announced today that they are dropping a special uniform for this coming season to pay homage to our Pennsylvania Dutch culture and the Pennsylvania Dutch culture of the Lehigh Valley that is very rich there. You can see some images there. They are incorporating a unique tech sign uh, in these uniforms. And from what I read on the website, they'll be wearing these on any Saturday that they have a home game. They changed the font uh, as well to make it look a little bit more Dutchy. And to show you um, 
the the hex sign there is just part of an image. Here's a bigger image. Our good friend Rachel Yoder was uh, the one who painted these. Uh, and then I've included here why they chose the symbols that they chose. This, of course, was the Iron Pigs that decided this, the cross baseball bats and the baseball in the middle. We get that. But the other four images, I was really interested in seeing why they chose those. And according, this is from their website, the pig they chose because it represents the Iron Pigs and Coca-Cola Park where they play. The traffic circle i thought this was really great too represents the easton circle slash square uh which is part of easton's iconic downtown they have an image of a strawberry which represents hess's strawberry pie and part of allentown history and then finally the moravian star which represents of course bethlehem's cultural history so i just want to give a huge shout out to the good people at the lehigh valley iron pigs for being creative and paying these homages to our culture and, you know, for the Lehigh Valley, the Pennsylvania Dutch are a very important part of that history. I, I would I would invite the Reading Phillies or the Reading Fight and Phils to try and do something like this as well. I mean, you can't talk about Berks County without Pennsylvania Dutch culture. So I'm just throwing out there and sharing that with everybody. You can order these jerseys and hats at their website if you go to shopironpigs.com. I looked. They are a little expensive. But. If you want something, sometimes you got to pay for it, right? So good shout out to the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs. I also want to give a quick shout out to an event that took place earlier this month. I advertised it last month, and that was the 32nd annual Ole Valley Pennsylvania Dutch for Sumling or get together. There were over 100 people in attendance at the Ole Valley Fairgrounds. Here's a picture from inside the, the fairgrounds hall. It was a day full of good music, Pennsylvania Dutch good food, fellowship, all the things that you would experience if you go to a traditional for Sumling. There was a lot of fear that this, this one was going to bite the dust and there weren't enough people interested in maintaining this for Sumling, but they had a great turnout this year based on the hard work and dedication of the people that put it together. So a shout out to the good people at the Ole Valley uh, for Sumling, and hopefully next year they'll have the 33rd annual. Every month I do my pay my shout out to a town somewhere in Pennsylvania Dutch country as a hee haw style salute to some town. And given who we have speaking tonight and what he's going to be talking about, I chose one and only Nazareth, Pennsylvania, founded in beautiful Northampton County, founded in 1740 population. The latest lumber I could see was 6,053 people, give or take, of course. And for a lot of people that don't know anything about Nazareth, maybe they know it for Martin Guitars, which are based there in Nazareth as well. But that is our salute to a Pennsylvania Dutch town for this month. I've schwetzed enough. I have talked enough. It's time to bring in the one and only Richard Mamana. And I can't wait. So I'm I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop right now. I'm going to pull this out and I'm going to say, okay, Richard, Kumaldrin. Richard, welcome to PA Dutch Live. Yeah, good a dog. Uh, good a dog. I bet nobody ever <laughs> said that. Uh, <laughs> thank you for having me on. You know, uh, it does it does say in scripture, nothing good can come from Nazareth. Uh, they do say that. They do say it does say that. <laughs> but you know, good things do come from Nazareth. Um absolutely. My uh, you know, one of my uh my Moravian uh grandparents was was at the founding of of Nazareth. That's crazy. Um, so it's uh you know the apple the apple only rolls as far as it can get boiled. Um <laughs> <laughs> well, Richard, I start every month in introducing our guests. For people that don't know you, or I always ask this question first: what, what what Pennsylvania Dutch ties do you have in your family tree, or at growing up, or what can you tell us a little bit about that before we get into your topic this evening? You you bet. Uh, so uh, my surname is Italian. Uh, my dad is is half Italian American, uh, uh, and there's a, a bit of uh, uh, Howell English in me. Uh, and all the rest is is Pennsylvania German. Um, so the the family surnames are Troxel and uh, Fanebecher, you know, which becomes Pennypacker, Wagner, Bohm, uh, Leidich, uh, you know, uh, 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 not Italian names. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so you know, I I live I live uh, about a third of a mile from a spot where my family lived in the 1680s uh, in Germantown. So it's, uh, you know, not very, not very, uh, not very adventurous in, in a sense, but, <laughs> but also, um, and, and I, I learn new things all the time. I, I had a brick wall of genealogy um, uh, that I, that I sorted out quite recently, um, uh, a surname that I couldn't get behind. And it turned out he was the, 
the the Eschbach, Esch, Esch, Eschbach or Eschenbach, was the founder of the Moravian Church in Berks County, uh, and turns out to be my sixth grandfather. Just astonishing That's stuff. Great. Very yeah. exciting. But on my dad's side, uh, mostly Pennsylvania German Lutherans um, and some Roman Catholics who come after the 1848 revolution who are not really Pennsylvania German. But um, And then on my mom's side, uh, Schwenkfelders and Moravians and uh, German reformed folks, uh, Bohm and Leidig, of course, are and Bidding, Bidding um, are the, the founders of the German reformed church in, um, in the United States. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, I grew up, I was baptized in a German Reformed congregation of the UCC. Uh, we had sour cr crocs in the basement. Uh, <laughs> closed when I was a child. The church closed when I was a child. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you when you have this kind of huge genetic religious funnel of options, <laughs> I sort of ended up uh, in, in, uh, in the Anglican tradition, in the Episcopal Church. Um, uh, but it's... Uh, you know, Pennsylvania German, um, uh, es war nicht mein Kirschbrach, aber, uh, you know, my neighbor, um, my neighbor Lucille Smith as a child was the secretary for many years to to, to Richard Druckenbrod, who was the president of the Pennsylvania German Society. And Drucki, as he was known to me, kind of uh, took me under his wing, gave me lots of books and cassette tapes and his Mirlana Deitch curriculum and said, you know, bleib was du bist, uh, you know, yeah. He said, yeah, "This is the language of your of your family." <laughs> uh, so, um, and even there were even older folks uh, in my in my childhood world who who were uh, Deutsch speakers. You know, the custodian at my elementary school, bus driver Mr. Bus. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, amazing people. Um, sure. That's great. That is so. The, the tree's big. The, the Pennsylvania Dutch tree is big, and that's sure great. Is. that is yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's get to it. So, your presentation tonight that you're going to tell us all about is, and I advertise this Pennsylvania Dutch tombstones. So, before we get into it, I just want to ask this question: How did you ever get interested in this topic? Well, you know, my grandmother, my grandmother Bertha Bertha Troxel, um, uh, she she was a sort of immediate Leidig Wagner uh, descendant uh, on the Reformed and Schwenkfelder sides, and uh, uh, you know, she loved nothing more than driving around uh, in the in the countryside. In town, she liked to sort of chase fire trucks, uh, and <laughs> in the country, it was it was cemeteries. You know, um, so um, uh, uh, the the real strong interest started um, when I was looking at genealogy, and realized that I I needed German for it, um, and that there was this remarkable. Um, you know, source of uh, of genealogical information, uh, carved in stone. I didn't even need books. Um, and uh, 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 you know, cemeteries have been ruining uh, uh, weekend family travel for uh, at least a hundred years. <laughs> so, very very indulgent family who sort of let me pull over and take some pictures uh, over and That's over. Good. I stumbled on a website uh, in about. 1999, uh, that's now defunct, uh, run by a woman named Sandra Hardy, uh, who was based in Texas. And I did some some sort of freelance work for her uh, in the summers in college. And uh, uh, she was a, so she was in Texas, but had taken a bunch of photographs in the 80s that she put on her website called Stones of Faith. Um, and she wrote a little booklet about how to read Pennsylvania German tombstones. Um, uh, it just sort of goes from there. I mean, I uh, if you look, you know, I've 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 uploaded about ten thousand photos of, <laughs> uh, of of grave markers or or related documents uh, on the Find a Grave website, which is uh, a mixed bag. Honestly, it's only as good as what people put into it. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, with with that amount of data, with that amount of time put into something, you start to recognize patterns. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, um, uh, it's, a it's, a it's a remarkable body of, of, of information about where and how language was used. Um, and also I do approach it as a, as a, as a, as a faithful person. I mean, I, um, I, anyone who's been with me to a cemetery, um, 
uh, you know, can can attest that I, I sing, <laughs> uh, which is, um, you know, which is quite meaningful to me, whether I'm visiting a place where family uh, are laid to rest or, um, or, uh, or, or not. Um, yeah. Well, let's, let's get into it. You sent me the presentation, so we'll do this. I'm your clicker. You just tell me when you need me to advance the slide sure, and off sure. we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on each one, but. Um, okay, your call. <laughs> so the, the one the one on the front on the first slide is um, uh, from a remarkable uh, uh, group in uh, in Crydersville at Zion's uh, Stone Church. Um, I caught it on a on a beautiful day. I think that was in July or August this year. Um, we'll talk about that carver uh, with some more focus, but go to the go to the next slide first. Sure thing. This is the this is the most famous Pennsylvania German tombstone, um, if there can be such a distinction. Um, it's in uh, it's near Wommelsdorf. Um, Margareta Graf, uh, who was uh, a, a pioneer, uh, a German speaker. It's it's a it's a beautiful stone, and it's um, you know I uh, there there is a, an almost complete absence of um, of the cross on Pennsylvania German tombstones, um, and in distinction to uh, the Puritan sort of New England um, skull crossbones kind of moralizing, uh, this is. Um, you know, this is what will, you will be sort of message. That's not what you see in Pennsylvania German uh, uh, folk art as it is carved in this time period. Um, it's not an angel either. Um, as an hidden angle, is as is an, house, an Hausfrau, yeah? Uh, you know, <laughs> angels don't have petticoats. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not as far as I know. Um, you know, she's, um, uh, that's her. That's her soul flying to heaven. Uh, she's uh, 37 years old. Uh, we don't we don't know very much about her, other than that she, um, you know, in this depiction, um, came from the earth and returned to it, and as uh, would be understood in her in her world, also came from God and went back to God. Um, uh, this is, I think, the the great, beautiful, uh, deep message. I do not know much about this carver. Um, uh, this carver's work um, is uh, is is very local, as most of them are, but it um, it has weathered time very very well. It's a uh, remarkable piece of of art. And uh, real quick, bef before we move on, this is something you and I had talked about before we started the show this evening. I think it's important for the audience to understand and know. You had told me about, um, and you you've researched this that when when somebody passed away. I mean, you had to pay for someone to carve these tombstones and oh, families sure. didn't families didn't always have the money necessary right away. Could you talk just a little bit about that, please? You bet. You bet. Um, and I can unpack that a little bit as as we go through. Um, so if you see a cemetery, uh, the stones you see are not representative of all of the of the number of people who are who are buried there, uh, even through the 1920s, 1930s in the United States in Northampton County. Uh, in some communities, um, a large number of people, uh, infants especially, uh, would never have a grave marker. But um, uh, we know from the work of, of people like uh, Michael Emery and Patrick Donmoyer that wooden uh, grave markers were were much more common, um, and that uh, even when there are stones uh, to mark a burial, um, that was often um, uh, uh, subsequent to the the death itself or the burial. So, you know, in Hellertown, for example, in Northampton County, um, you'll see um, the date of the stone at the top rather than the date of the death. So you can have two dates. So you might have a family who have five stones made at once for people who have died over the past 10 years because of financial considerations or, um, or who knows what else. Um, we also don't have this this burial practice in Europe, right? Um, there's a, a temporary burial is the more sort of uh, regular thing in in modern Europe. Uh, you know, renting a renting a grave rather than having a 
a permanent place. So the new world innovation is that, um, <coughs> pardon me, um, you know, every family sort of uh, can have uh, this sort of uh, marker of a person's life in a way that wasn't wasn't possible in the same way in the old world. Um, but we'll, we'll look at another one. Okay. <coughs> this is not my photograph. This is, this is a photo by, by Jenny Mamana. Uh, I think last autumn, uh, the Brickerville Carver is another, uh, remarkable, uh, remarkable, uh, folk artist, uh, of, of the early period. Um, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a, a design you will see all over Lancaster County. Um, and also as far east as Easton, there's a very strange outlier uh, in Hayes Cemetery in Easton. Um, very early, uh, very, very strange that it would end up there with a carver who's based in Lancaster. You'll see his work in both German and English, um, but this I'm just sort of putting in to show some of the diversity of design. Uh, so if you go to the next one, I think there's another example. This, it's just, it's just, incredible incredible work uh again not my photograph um uh this is this is uh from i think this photograph is from the farber collection uh which is unfortunately undated uh but a very fine photograph there are some newer newer photos i think by michael emery in the pennsylvania german tombstones group um this again is just an example of uh uh uh, something on the later end of what I study, but just remarkably powerful art. And this this design turns out to be based um, on or related to uh, uh, stove stove plate art, mm. which is also a really rich seam of of, of figural uh, figural art. So we'll look at another one. Oh, this is this is where it sort of begins. It's not a self portrait. Um, uh, <laughs> Well, you know, uh, well, anyway, uh, so in um, Farber, Farber begins to identify uh, uh, somebody called the Puffy Cheek Cherub Carver, um, whose, whose work seems to be um, uh, coherent in a local way uh, and, and not like anything else around it. So, so who do we, I mean, what do we, what do we even see here? Who is, who is this? What's happening? Um, this, this will become um, my sort of way into, into the, the bigger topic uh, that I have. So if, if we go past the puffy cheek cherub carver here again, um, we, we have, we have the same, the same person at work. There's so much going on here. That's uh, so much going on here. Um, again, you know, it, uh, uh, I think we can see a few things going on. The drawing um, on the right-hand side is by Eleanor Barba, um, who is uh, Eleanor Martin Barba, who is a, a, a fascinating uh, artist uh, and scholar in her own right who worked with uh, the great Preston Barba. And I'll talk a bit more about them. Um, this stone, so the drawing is probably from about 1950, before 1952 or 53. Um, the photograph is mine from 2019. And you can see, you can see even in the intervening, you know, uh, 50, 50 years or so, that the, um, the encroachment of lichen is quite serious. Uh, and uh, just sort of, sort of normal weather where uh, that will happen to anything that's outside under the, the rain and the sun and with car exhaust and all the rest of it. Um, so we'll go again to the next screen. Here in the same kind of geographic cluster in the same time period is, um, is pomegranates uh, in a vase or a vase. Wie sagt man vase auf Deutsch? That's a good cool. question. Cool. I'm not, cool, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, right. Cool. Yeah, it's just a cup. So, yeah. so, so it's a, you know what? What are we looking at here? Um, uh, they're not. Uh, some people call it the tulip and vase, tulip and vase carver. Um, uh, a couple things to parse, I think. Um, you've got a cup with dirt in it, and you've got life 
coming out of it. Um, you know, all sorts of things I think you could look at um, in a religious perspective about death, rebirth, resurrection, burial, um, uh, uh, nature, religion, uh, lots to lots to lots to think about. But um, what one thing I think I think I think it's very funny that tulips get so um, uh, put onto Pennsylvania German culture because tulips, of course, are are Turkish. <laughs> and they kind of only end up in Europe, you know, because of Dutch people's gambling addictions around the time of Rembrandt, right? So, <laughs> so tulips are about as traditionally Pennsylvania German as, you know, maybe microwaves are to us right now. <laughs> you know, it's a pretty new thing um, to have uh, as part of your your folk culture. I could be wrong about that, but I. Um, uh, anyway, we we begin to see a really clear, distinct style. Of, uh, of carving, of uh, consistency of motifs, and also um, the frames become very clearly uh, the work of same per the same person. So if we look at the next one, here it is again. So these are at, at Crydersville. Again, it's the same frame, the same stone, uh, the, same, the same bloom uh, uh, within, uh, within a, a cup that's meant to symbolize something about human life and death and uh, ongoing memory. So um, we'll go next again. Here is some more uh, a couple miles away. Um, the same work, the same time period. Um, uh, remarkably strong designs that are not like anything else around them. So this person, um, uh we'll go we'll go one more ahead please uh the other side of the stones has extremely characteristic lettering um uh there's a on the on the bottom is one of my my laubach ancestors on the on the left um uh those stones were were placed in a, a memorial sort of uh frame I think in 1971 or 1972. So we lost the backs. We lost the, the figural art that was on them. Um, but if you go to the next screen, again, this is Hellertown. Uh, this, is a, this is a great example of, uh, of what holds all of the imagery together because the imagery changes a, a, a fair amount uh, within this group. So the numbers are very easy to see as the, as the work of one person. The E, the lowercase E, is very consistent, and the lowercase R is very consistent. Um, once in a while, you see an N that's reversed. There could be some kind of semi-magical things going on there, apotropaic, you know, warding off evil. That's open to interpretation. Uh, the lettering is, is definitely the work of one person. So if we go again to another screen, uh, this is Eleanor Martin Barba and Preston Barba, uh, you know, doing what they did for fun. Uh, it's too, <laughs> it's too close to the nose uh, here. <laughs> this is, this could be taken, unfortunately, from from my life if I had a little less hair and were about twenty years older. Um, Barba, you know, with his friend Buffington, um, uh, is is one of the the great brilliant men of the 20th century who works on Pennsylvania German language and culture. Uh, Eleanor turns out to be, you know, probably actually the, the, the more serious uh, academic of, of the pair, uh, and certainly the, the better artist. Um, uh, Preston went to Muhlenberg and then to Yale and then went to Penn for his doctorate. Eleanor um, was from Indiana, actually, from a German family in Indiana. And uh, she was the Phi Beta Kappa member. Um, he was not. So uh, she she was brilliant, and uh, her her work, um, her artwork, her portraits of of nineteen of twentieth century Pennsylvania German people are really remarkable. The the John Bermelin portrait is uh, mm -hmm. is just uh, striking and and fun. Um, I I wonder where that portrait is, but the great the great gift of that pair and their driving around the countryside in Northampton and Berks and uh, Lehigh and, and Lancaster 
and all around is this book um, published by the Pennsylvania German Folklore Society. My, my copy is a bit uh, worked over. Um, uh, is illustrations of, of stones as they looked in the 1940s, many of which are no longer extant. Uh, uh, some, are, some are gone through human activity, and some are gone through decay. Um, but the, the, the pair of them captured uh, a moment uh, in, in the ongoing, um, uh, uh, ongoing presence of the stones in places where they, they no longer remain and, and gave us something really wonderful. The book is expensive <laughs> and hard to find. And uh, you know, it would be a wonderful thing to have reprinted if that were, were possible uh, at some point. Um, but they identified this, this work uh, that I've been talking about in the last few slides as the Northampton County Carver. So uh, we assume it's a he, uh, that's, that's kind of arbitrary, but um, uh, uh, the, the working identity of, of the person uh, as the Northampton County Carver continues uh, for the next couple decades. Uh, we can go ahead to the next slide. Until 2019, <laughs> when I'm going through uh, family estate inventories um, for basically other reasons, and I stumble on uh, uh, payment for tombstone carving to someone called Jacob Motz, uh, M-O-T-Z, or sometimes M-O-A-T-S. And it's consistent across the stones that I can identify in the burial yards. So I have in Forks Township, where the Northampton County archives are, um, uh, you know, a half dozen uh, written pieces of evidence of a person named Jacob Motz, Motz who was uh, a tombstone carver and the prices. So we have a name, <laughs> you know, we have a name for this anonymous uh, pioneer artist. And uh, so I posted with great excitement online that I had identified the Northampton County Carver. You know, some people try to find the source of the Nile. Uh, <laughs> This is enough for me. So uh, if we <laughs> so we go to the, so here he is, Hans Jakob Motz. Um, he's a Lutheran. He's from Lampartsloch, which is in is in France now. It's German speaking France. Um, he we have his birth record, his baptism record, his marriage record, his arrival record in Philadelphia. Uh, we know, you know, we know the names of his children and his wife. We also know uh, from missionary records and from uh, communion records where he went to church, uh, Emmanuel's Church in uh, Moore Township in uh, Northampton County, uh, and also at uh, Beard's Church in Leitersburg in, in Maryland. Uh, it's the same person, and he is a Revolutionary War veteran. Uh, and a farmer, and uh, uh, that's a, a photo of his hometown in the back there from Wikipedia. It's not my picture. I've never been to Lampertsloch. Um, <laughs> but I, I have done some some uh, some work to try to identify the source of his imagery. Uh, and it's not it's not in Alsace, you know. It's not it's not in Bahrain. It's not in it's not in the immediate community that he was from, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, I've written to to folks in uh, in Lombardsloch and asked for photos of local cemeteries. Nothing there looks like his work. Um, so you have, I think, a remarkably original um, early American mind at work uh, in these in these stones in Northampton County. If you go to the next screen, I think, so these are, this is the distribution of the stones. Uh, this is, this is Google Maps uh, where I've dropped pins uh, where all of the stones can be uh, verified by the, the lettering in particular, which also happened to be all communities in which he, he lived or communities in which his, uh, his clergy uh, were part of the local Lutheran or Reformed char charges 
uh, which often had multiple points of congregations. So you have, I, I don't, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I, this is something I was just thinking of. So uh, someone like this guy or these other carvers, were they essentially traveling salesmen and that they would they would haul stones around and they would show up in a town and say, who needs stones carved? Or would they have a workshop and people came to them? Do, do we know what that was, what that life was like for these guys? I do not know. OK, uh, I think I think we're getting closer to some ideas uh, about that. Uh, so now Moats is, Moats is in, um, uh, in Pennsylvania and, and Maryland, uh, for 35 years, uh, Max, we don't have a certain death date for him. Um, he also has no tombstone, <laughs> uh, you know, as, as it goes. Um, uh, but there are about 50 stones that are certainly his. And we know the amount uh, he got for one, uh, which varied a bit. Uh, but uh, we know um, we know we know we 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 don't know how long it took him to make one. Uh, we do know that a very small percentage of the population in any community where he was got a stone like this. Um, uh, so the locations are are fascinating. Uh, Northampton County Carver turns out to be the correct, you know, name for him, but uh, but he you know goes into far western New Jersey uh, at the Straw Church Yard in Warren County and Greenwich Township, uh, where some of my Bidelman ancestors are buried, and uh, where some wagoners and Howells and folks like that are buried in my family tree. Um, uh, they were slaveholding. Pennsylvania Germans who lived in New Jersey, where the laws were uh, were more lax about slavery, uh, slaveholding Pennsylvania German Lutherans hmm. in in Western New Jersey. Uh, so that's the Warren County Stone. There's only one of those, and I I think there are only two or three in Washington County, Maryland, where he went uh, toward the end of his life. But the migration. So so the uh, part of the bigger picture. You're going to have to do a sequel to this because people are going to love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, part of the fascinating thing is that the, the Sprachsraum, you know, the old the old speech world of Pennsylvania Germans, goes from from New York through New Jersey, all through Pennsylvania, and down into Maryland, and then into the Carolinas and Virginias, mm -hmm. um, and then of course west uh, at a later time. But even in the very early period, uh, there are some continuities of of language, imagery, practices. Uh, and beautiful, remarkable stuff in the Carolinas. Uh, some of that's, you know, Moravian life being in, in, in both of those places, but, but some of it's also just the bulk of population movement. The, the standouts are, are really these, these almost shockingly beautiful things in Crytersville. Uh, there are some in Emanuelsville too, that are in much worse condition. Uh, you know, you can sit with this stone and think, uh, what was the emotional world of these folks? Mm. Um, what did it mean to have a stone you could visit and think about someone? What did it mean to be able to read something in your own language? What did it mean for folks after German wasn't the normal daily language to visit people who had become strange in their in their language you know yeah. so many questions and so many invitations to to reflection about um uh, you know a, a kind of tactile tangible evidence of where language was used um and when and by whom and what for uh it's there's just so many places you can go with these questions but but go ahead to the next one here's another one i mean um uh, Motz himself was a was a veteran. Uh, here is is Johannes Friedrich Schumacher, also at Crytersville. Uh, kind of a characteristic stone uh, with the the Kop Kop und Blumenstein uh, in very very good condition. Uh, the cemetery itself is also just extremely well maintained. It's a it's a beautiful place to visit. And as you can see, the sky was clear, and it was, I was borrowing a nice 
new iPhone that is not mine. I have a, <laughs> my iPhone weighs three pounds. It's, I think it's an iPhone nine. It's, it's useless. <laughs> anyway, you can go to the next one. Here's another one from, from Zion Stone Search. It's a Zonenblum. It's a Zonenblum. It's a, it's a sunflower. And the sunflower, what does the sunflower do? It turns, it turns to the creator. It turns to the sun. It turns to the source of life. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are these wonderful folk beliefs about not cutting down uh, the sunflower because it's the only plant that knows how to pray. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I, I look at this and I, I, I love it because it's so beautiful and creative. And, uh, and it also, um, it's also, you know, in the, in the modern Pennsylvania German world, and I think for the last couple of decades, for the last century anyway, there's been a kind of uh, strict-ish separation between the, the Karakteich and the, and, the, and the, you know, the churchy German folks, the Lutherans and Reformed, and then later UCC, and the Erglava folks, the folks who, who are keen on folk traditions of religion and belief and, and practice mysticism, all the rest of it. I think, I think in the 18th century, uh, even though there was strict ecclesiastical Christianity, obviously, as the, as the context for all of this, everything was happening together. And, and there was a lot of um, mutual awareness of the community uh, of, of traditions we would now say are separate from each other. But then I think we're, we're just not. Um, yeah. So the sunflower and the pomegranate and the cup uh, and the sun and the, the earth are all here. And on the other side is the text of the psalm that was used at the sermon or the uh, at the burial or some hopeful verse about the resurrection or about suffering being ended. Um, it's it's very synthetic and together. Yeah, I guess I have a question, too. I mean, I've walked a lot of old cemeteries as a kid and, and I've seen these kinds of stones my whole life. And we know that, you know, all the stones you showed us are predominantly from the 1700s. At, at what point did they stop doing this kind of like imagery and and just turn to name, date yeah. of birth, date of death? And and why do you think that changed happened? Was it because there weren't carvers out there or it became just too expensive or that this imagery was was lost? What I mean, it, I don't know if you know the answer, but what do you think? I don't know the answer. I do know. I do know that as Pennsylvania Germans become... Uh, normal Americans in the middle 19th century, later 19th century, the Victorian imagery of of English language stones is identical to yeah. you know what you would see uh, in German or in English. And I could show you dozens, hundreds of examples of that too. Um, I do. I, I think this is just a an extraordinary example of of human genius uh, yeah. at work <laughs> in a couple instances. There are other carvers whose work is, um, you know, completely recognizable as as their own and no one else's. They, uh, they, I don't know where he comes from. I mean, I know the location he comes from. I don't know where his his artistic mind comes from. I don't know where his his consistency over three decades comes from. Um, I think. I think also as population expands, as more people can afford stones. You're probably going to get less special stones with sure. less with less decoration, um, with text based, you know, presentation of of what the person's uh, beginning and end were. Also, there's diversity in the very beginning of that with the Pennsylvania German community. So Moravian stones are extremely plain, uh, and they're horizontal to the ground, um, and uh, you would see also a lot of diversity in burial practices. So, in some families, uh, in some communities, there are family uh, co-location of, of burial in other communities, you're buried in order of when you die. Yeah. And in Moravian cemeteries, you would be buried separated by gender in order that you die. Yeah. Um, and all of that's about how the church life itself is organized too. Um, Randy has a quick question for you. What is the stone that they typically used? I'm not a stone person. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. And the discoloration is is so sandstone. I think is is often the material that most used. Uh, there is slate uh, in some places, which is in rough shape. 
Uh, there's limestone in other places that's also in rough shape. Marble also is used, and that is in terrible shape. But there's a whole lot of, um, there's so many disciplines that come into play here. Uh, there's there's geology, that's the stone study, right? Geology uh, and economy, you know, uh, networks of trade, um, all the rest. Um, also soil science, which is not my thing, and hydrology, you know, water flow and how that impacts stones, all the rest. Um, other minds need to do that stuff because I don't know how. <laughs> this, is, this is a funny headline. I think it's very funny. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't experience any of this as morbid. Uh, I, I, I find it a wonderful uh, sort of invitation to uh, curiosity and, and, and uh, time in nature and being around people who are, you know, not on their computers uh, who are not doing work, who are not, uh, who are not in a rush. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, it is a lively hobby, you know? <laughs> uh, so if you go to the next one, um, so there's this great group called Pennsylvania German tombstones on Facebook. Uh, I decided to make a new one because, um, uh, you know, not everybody in the bigger Pennsylvania German groups wants to see stuff about tombstones all the time. So that's fine. Uh, the, the the work of other people is also something I really want to highlight. This is not my this is not mine, right? It, in the sense that common knowledge is something that belongs to everyone. It's common cultural uh, common cultural information and property. So the James Cooper and Michael Emery, Jason Searock, Laura Thomas, the Yoders, Hunter and Rachel are all lifting up this imagery and Patrick Donmoyer too. Patrick has tens of thousands of better pictures than I do. Um, they're, um, it's a fun group. Uh, people are focused on one thing and they do uh, a good job. It's a private group because I got tired of t-shirt ads uh, that people <laughs> were posting. Yeah. I hear you. I hear but anybody you. can find it. Uh, nope. so, yeah, that, you, go ahead. Um, uh, that's the book. Uh, there are some other books to read. Um, the, so uh, this this book, The Masks of Orthodoxy, about folk gravestone carving in colonial Massachusetts is what someone needs to do for this body of stuff. Uh, it, it's, it's brilliant from the art historical and religious and economic angles. It, extraordinarily well done. I don't have the, the chops or the focus to do it myself. But, um, you know, there, a book like this would be a beautiful thing to see from the, based on the work of these carvers. Art photography that uses uh, this as its subject, I think, would have uh, a, wonderful, a wonderful audience, but also be another time in our generation of capturing what they look like right now, because they're going to look different in 10 years or 20 years yeah. or 40 years. Other resources, uh, there are some online things here. We can throw this up online somewhere. This is the old Stones of Faith website, which has been gone for five or six years. Um, uh, but if you go again to the next one. Yeah, so there, it's not all beautiful. It's not all happy. Right. Um, it's hard to know what happened to some of them. This is clearly Moses' work, um, uh, half of it. And uh, some efforts at preservation have not been good. Uh, when you put a stone in concrete, uh, it doesn't contract and expand in the same way with the response to cold, freezing, uh, water absorption as as it would otherwise. Uh, that's a, a, a family stone on the right-hand side. There are just beautiful ways of photographing the ones that do remain, even with lichen on them. Um, if you go again forward, Oh, this is so Patrick Patrick Don Moyer, who is a, a hero of our our cultural world, uh, made me a book plate based on my Laubach family ancestors uh, stones in in Lower Saucon in Hel in Northampton Hellertown. Um, uh, he he reassembled the broken stone, uh, and and made me uh, made me a book plate too. Awesome. So the, the 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 life of the imagery goes on is my only point to bring that up. Um, yeah. And uh, and then next uh, acknowledgments. There's there's a there's a there's a young maiden uh, carrying on the tradition, uh, taking better <laughs> pictures than I do. 
uh, and uh, again, you know, uh, I it's a, I I I love I love being in nature, observing all of the things that happen around a churchyard. Your book, Stim Ausum Karachov, uh, is this wonderful sort of Spoon River anthology of Pennsylvania German life, right? And the stories all come from the all come from the churchyard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and it's not it's not moralizing. It's not morbid. It's this sort of invitation to joy and presence and ongoing uh, relationship. Um, you know, mehr bleiben in der alte Weg. You know, in so einer Gottes Himmel You know, we stay yeah. in the old way and we we go to God's heaven. It's not a. It's not. There's no cruelty. There's no. There's not even a, at at the at the remove of two centuries. There's not even really sorrow. There's just gratitude for people's faithfulness. Yeah. Uh, Richard, I mean, we, there's so much we could we could talk for another two yeah. hours for I sure, because um, we didn't even really talk much about. I mean, we looked at a lot of imagery, but we didn't talk about language use. Yeah, and yeah. you know how they chose some of that, but yeah. it, that's just a reason to have you back on in yeah. a future episode. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I would love it. I mean, there are also the couples where his tone is in German and hers is in English. Yes, yeah, because there, there are bilingual stones. There are yeah. stones that are half in English and half in German. It's not as subtitles before there was TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I would invite anyone who's really interested in this or found this topic to be, you know, really interesting. Of course, check out the links that um, Richard talked about. I'll link some of, you know, I'll link all this stuff also in the show notes. Um, and, and, I would invite all of you to do exactly what Richard and I have been doing most of our lives. You see an old cemetery, you pull off to the side of the road and you just walk it because you don't have to have any relatives buried in that cemetery to yeah. take something from that experience. Yeah. Um, and if you can read German or Pennsylvania Dutch, sometimes that'll help you depending on the stones. But I've gotten, I've had great experiences walking among stones that are all in English and just reading reading what people chose to put on those stones and seeing the imagery and, mm -hmm. and the peacefulness that, that is, I mean, the, the word, you know, you can use the word Karikhof churchyard in Pennsylvania Dutch, but you can also say in German Friedhof, a mm -hmm. place of peace. Yeah. And yeah. you know, a cemetery is that yeah. or goddess acre, God's yeah. acre yeah. is yeah. used a lot times too. Yeah. And just the imagery of those words alone for me has always been, I have never been sad. Well, I shouldn't say that. There have been times when I've been sad walking in cemeteries, but yeah. a lot of times I I get a sense of life mm. walking among those old mm. stones. Me mm. personally, at least. Well, the birds, the birds are there. The trees are there. Yeah. You know the the it's a it's a chance to slow down. Uh, you know <laughs> where are we hurrying to anyway? But um, yeah, right. uh, you also you only really need about sixty words of of German, right? <laughs> to, to that's right. No, to read these stones, the numbers are the same. The text is formulaic for the most part. Gestorben, yeah. geboren, or heiratet. You know, it's who's born when and married to whom and what and whatever. Ea Frau, uh, you know, all the rest. The numbers are the same. The months are the same. Uh, the lettering is not the same. But it's 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 not hard. It's not hard to to get that down. Yeah. So. Um, uh, but the great thing about the internet is that you can find the other 600 people who are interested in anything, <laughs> right? It can yeah. butter, butter molds or, you know, toy trains from Reading or beer labels from, yeah. you know, Scranton, whatever it is. You can find the other people who have knowledge, who have wisdom to share, who have enthusiasm, who who care enough about something to preserve it, to explain it to teach each other um and to and to listen and to and to work together there's amazing work uh going on with with preservation laura thomas uh, I've, yeah. I've mentioned again uh berks county um uh graveyard preservation uh, organization i'm not sure the exact name of it there's also great work around schwenkfelder cemeteries which are cared for very well by our by our lineage society and organization but, but how many syllables do you have when you say Ber Berks County? But three Berks County. Berks <laughs> County. <laughs> oh, when I say in Pennsylvania Dutch, Berks. Berks County. Yeah. yeah. Well, we should work on that. We should get that back to the four syllable normal. Berks. Berks County. Berks County. <laughs> Sounds good. Richard, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on. I will absolutely have you on again because we have more things we need to talk about and you have more photos that you can share. For yeah, sure. 
Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And I wish you and your family a very happy Thanksgiving. And thank keep you. Keep doing the work that you are doing. Please. Thank you, sir. Thank you for everything stop. you do. Yeah, you're thank a great you. you're a great inspiration. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Take care, Richard. <laughs> thank you. Leave a lie. What can I say? Can you beat that? Really? My goodness. My goodness. Richard is a wealth of knowledge and a wonderful person to boot, as you could tell. I mean, I think all of us would want to sit down and have have a cup of coffee with Richard or he should lead cemetery walks. Now, there you go, Richard. Think about that for the new year. You know you would have people signing up for that. I know I would sign up for a cemetery walk with, with Richard for sure. I will put a lot of the links that he mentioned about things you can check out, but we need to keep going here. A couple things I like to share with everybody here before we leave um, for the month. Uh, every month I bring you a Pennsylvania Dutch bit of literature, and this week I bring you a poem. If you follow my blog, you saw this already because I posted it, but here it is tonight for those who didn't see that. It is the month of Thanksgiving, and I went to a very well-known female Pennsylvania Dutch poet, Florence Baver, who was born in 1912, lived all the way up till 1999. And this is one of her poems called Da Beit Dog is Vida Do. Thanksgiving is here again. Um, in Pennsylvania Dutch, we have the word Beit Dog. We also have Dangsfest. We have more than one word for Thanksgiving. But here is her poem. I'll read the Pennsylvania Dutch, which is on the left-hand side. You can follow along if you don't understand on the right with the English there. But here we go. Da Beit Dog is Vida Do. Da betok is vida do, un es glapat yo so, in da kich, blendi ar of it for me. Welsh hana und lots fils fun sache, muss ich na ready mache, in da kich, is es gespas for me. Kuche und viel boy, stehne schon in roroi, in da kich, oh, es schwitzt mich. Die kinne kummer al heim, will wetter, sie achter wieder es seem. In der Kich, ei, es lächert mich. Et mir esse, du ne mir beide. Später schwapper mir Reseda. In der Kich, blend die Haarlichkeit für mich. Der Bettdog kommt und geht. Gute werde geblanzt und gezäht. In der Kich, es ist all so freilich für mich. Well, how about that? A great poem from Florence Baver, uh, a well-known Pennsylvania Dutch poet. You can find some of her stuff in various publications out there. I'm going to skip our song for the month. We're running a little long, and that's okay. I'll save it for another episode. That's fine. But I do want to end with a couple other things yet. Of course, I mentioned this last week. It's getting into the Christmas season, too, right around the corner. If you're looking for a great Christmas gift for someone you know, why don't you stop at our Zazzle shop and pick up some of our awesome PA Dutch merch? We had some brand new, uh, brand new uh, things drop last month we have the elbadrich on the left and a hex sign a really simple plain rosette on the right we have of course people that are showing off their stuff that they have we got norman there in germany wearing the i i i know him all and we got mo with his donovetta and we got doug strange uh there with his mock scoot shirt on please visit our website p uh, zazzle.com backslash pa dutch stuff to get your own pennsylvania dutch theme merch you don't have to get a t-shirt you can get any one of these images printed on other things like stickers and magnets or uh aprons for in the kitchen just think about all the things there's like over a thousand different products you can get our stuff put on to so please check out the website zazzle.com backslash pa dutch stuff mm -hmm. great place to visit when you're thinking for that hard person you know that person that's hard to get for for christmas or if you're going to play the part of the bell schnickel the bell schnickel's got to bring pennsylvania dutch themed stuff people he has to he has to also if you like what we do here please and you'd like to and you'd like to financially support us you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com backslash Doug Mainford. I say it every month. Any money that I receive is used purely for the upkeep of the channel. And you don't want to buy any, you don't want to buy me a coffee. That's fine too. But I don't want you to stop subscribing. And I don't want you to keep, you know, stop tuning in. So please do that, dear friends. And I want to give a shout out to some people that recently bought me some coffee. Alan Moyer, Seth Moe, Gary jo jo Johansson, Ginger Herta, Todd Santi, Wendy Baker, and Owen Wengard uh, over the last couple of weeks have been buying some coffees. And I just wanted to give them a personal shout out. Before I leave for the month, I do want to take a minute. And since this is Thanksgiving is next week, I wanted to say really quickly some things that I'm thankful for. It's that we have to do this. We have to take time to really consider what are our blessings? What are we thankful for? So I just came up with three quick things uh, before the show started that I wanted to say to all of you. Number one, I am thankful for you. 
you the viewers, you the subscribers that keep me doing what I'm doing. You are the reason I come back every month and put this show together and search for interesting guests and, and do the work necessary to hopefully bring you what you feel is quality content and something that you're worth your time tuning into each month or the other videos that I'm posting on YouTube. Thank you for being who you are and continuing to support me in this journey. And another person or people I need to thank, and, and I am very thankful for, is my family, my wife and my kids who allow me the time to come down here in the basement in the studio and do this stuff and and allow me to go and go to for sumlings or, or Groundhog Lodge meetings or whatever it is and, and do the things that I'm doing to help preserve our culture and our language and to push it forward into the future. And then finally, the last thing that I'm truly thankful for is what we were talking about tonight. It's my forefathers, our forefathers and our foremothers for setting that foundation, for doing what they did so that we can all be here today and for the, what they did in preserving our language and culture, that it was still something that was there for my generation, your generation to have and to take and to move forward with those people. We can't physically thank them, but we can thank them through prayer, through thought through whatever it is, however you maybe try to talk to your former, your former uh, relatives and your your the former generations that came before us, but I am truly thankful for what they did to get me to where I am today, and I am I see it as my as my mission to make sure that what they did gets told and passed on to future generations. Hopefully, you feel the same way that I do. Dear friends, it is the end of the month. It's the end of the episode. I want you to mark your calendars because. A little bit than one month from now will be our December issue of issue, our December show for PA Dutch Live on the 20th of December. And I will be welcoming on special guest Craig Benner. And Craig is an expert in all things Ephrata Cloister. So if you have always wondered, what, what is the Ephrata Cloister? Like, what was that all about? They slept on wooden pillows. What? I heard that sometime. Craig's going to tell us the history of the cloister, and I'm sure we're going to have a good discussion about Mr. Beisel, the guy that founded the order, and, and you know how did this even come to be? It's going to be an awesome episode, so please mark your calendars. December 20th, it is a Wednesday, 6 p.m., right here on the YouTube channel, as we're all getting ready for the bell schnickel and all those good things that happen in, in late December as we get ready for Christmas. But until then, dear friends, I wish all of you a very blessed, and happy Thanksgiving. I hope your tables are full, and I hope that you have space to invite guests to your table to share your joy and your Thanksgiving with someone else who needs it probably more than we all do. Till then, dear friends, I wish you the best. And if you're one of those people out there that are going hunting after Thanksgiving for deer in rifle season here in Pennsylvania, please be safe out there. Shoot that big buck and uh, turn some of it into a mincemeat pie for Christmas, right? Just like what my grandparents always used to do. But until next month, dear friends, keep watching here on the YouTube channel. Keep supporting what we're doing here. Check out the Zazzle shop. Buy me a coffee, whatever you want to do. Subscribe, like, tell all your friends about the good things we're doing here. And until next month, dear friends, please, happy Thanksgiving. And as we say in Pennsylvania Dutch, Max Good. <laughs> Max gut zu dir, Max gut zu dir, Max gut zu dir for now. Unsere Zeit ist all und so, es ist Max gut for now. Hoff wieder mit dir zu sein, hoff du bringst er ich ein Freund. Max gut zu dir, Max gut zu dir, Max gut zu dir for now. Unsere Zeit ist all und so, es ist Max gut von now. Hoff wieder mit dir zu sein, hoff du bringst er ich ein Freund. Und so Max gut, Max gut, lieber Freund, Max gut.